the past three years on this channel, I made it my mission to watch all of Matt Pat's FNAF theory videos because I wanted to catch up to where most of you are in the understanding. I wanted to understand it all. I wanted to go through that journey like you did. When I first started this channel, I was watching like one video every day or so. Um, I was putting out a lot of videos. And then as my jobs changed, my priorities changed, you know, life happens. I wasn't able to keep up with constant FNAF reaction videos or commentary reaction videos as much as I would like. So the uploads started to slow down with FNAF theories. I mixed different things in there. But then I was looking at the list of videos I still have to watch. And I was overwhelmed thinking, is this going to take me another three years? No, it's not actually because I said, fuck it. I'm going to watch all of them today. And that's what I did. Sunday, January 21st, 2024 was my breaking point. So this is what's going to happen. In the first part of this video, I'm going to share with you the, like a brief summary of what I've learned from this marathon. And that's going to be sectioned into three parts. The first being summarizing Matt Pat's theories. The second is going to summarize FNAF's theories. So John on the FNAF channel, I watched some of his videos because they do influence Matt Pat's theories, his mo more current theories. So I watched some of his videos on security breach. And then the third section will be summarizing what I learned from watching ID's fantasy, her theories. So let's, let's start with this. I'm not an FNAF education channel at all. Don't expect this summary to be neatly tied with a bow. This is just me. J just me. Okay. <laughs> so there's some details that I'll skip over probably, but um, yeah, please, if you're new to the FNAF floor, don't, don't take this for like of a, a professional. Okay, there are probably other channels you can go check out for more detailed, um, well thought out FNAF timeline summaries. Okay, in the second part of this video, I'm going to share with you some of my initial reaction to Matt's most recent FNAF theory video. Um, so, where do we start? Where do we freaking start? Oh, well, at the beginning, Serena. So the very beginning of how FNAF all started. Matt titles this part of his timeline as the Foundations of Freddy's. It all starts in the 1930s. And William Afton, a young wee lad at this time, is inspired by a roadside attraction with a dancing bear. One day, he wants to grow up and build his own entertainment enterprise. And he does. He finds really, the, I would say, the Disney, the Walt Disney of the FNAF universe, a guy named Henry Emily. William Afton and Henry Emily pair together and they create what is known as Freddy Fazbear's, and they create the first set of animatronics. Now, what I found interesting about this part of the timeline and Matt's description of the animatronics that came first were that it wasn't the well-known animatronics that we know and love, Foxy, Freddy, Bonnie, Chica. It was a whole set of other animatronics. And from Afton and Henry's collaboration throughout the years, 
it eventually developed into the Grand Slam team that we know. So that was very interesting. As Henry and William continue their work together, the Springlock suit is born, which tragically leads to William's son, the crying child, being the victim of the bite of 83. Now, this is where things start to turn because William, distraught, jealous of Henry, still having a living child, starts to drink. And fueled with jealousy and grief over his son dying, William takes the life of Henry's daughter. Her name, I forgot her name, but her name is Charlie. I looked it up. Her name is Charlie. So he takes the life of Henry's daughter, Charlie. Now with Charlie's death, something starts to develop. The possession of animatronics. Charlie's soul is in the puppet. William figures this out and is intrigued. And his obsession with trying to bring his son back to life, trying to fix him, starts to grow. And he starts offing kids. That's wrong. How do you even say that? I don't know. But he goes on a spree. And he also goes on to develop even more intricate, well-designed animatronics in order to capture kids and at this point in the timeline i'm even still a little confused with sister location because a lot happened there and the position of sister location events within the timeline at this point is still a little iffy we think that sister location happened like uh, earlier in the timeline than we thought but as of now, in my understanding, um, I'm just going to put it here. And unfortunately, he loses another child, Elizabeth Afton. She just got a little too close one day to the animatronic baby and got scooped. Yeah, so she's done. But her soul possesses baby now. And so he shuts that down. But unknowingly, William's third child, the oldest, and what's his name? Michael. He goes down and finds sister location, what his father has been up to all this time. And he does a little digging, trying to figure out what's happening. And he too gets a little too close and gets scooped. But... Things are iffy with Michael because at one point he's still alive, but he's not at the same time. It's weird. It's weird. But he's he's still roaming around a little bit, let's just say. So he's not quite dead yet. But that happens. So now all of freaking William's children are somewhat dead. And so what happens now? Well, William's partner, Henry, who lost his daughter, Charlie is fed up fed up with all these kids dying going missing he's done he wants to end all of this and so he eventually lures all the animatronics and william into the pizzeria i think this is the nap six and he burns it all but it doesn't work Oh boy, things are to get messy. Now, the burning down of the pizzeria, that leads to the end of Fazbear Entertainment being known as a corporate entity. Only for it to be reborn into an LLC. Now you're wondering, okay, what does that mean? 
Well, from my understanding of what Matt said, an LLC really means limited, um, limited ownership. And the owners don't have people hovering over them watching what they're doing with the company. So basically, this allows William, who isn't dead, to be able to continue doing what he's doing. And William does whatever the fuck he wants. <laughs> he starts trying to rehabilitate Freddie Fazbear's image, its reputation. And the direction starts to go more towards VR, utilizing VR. And this is also when the AR game delivery service, whatever it's called, is born. And with this new company direction, we start to get introduced to new characters, Vanessa and Vanny. Vanessa and Vanny are very important characters in the security breach game because apparently they are William's versions of his daughter, Elizabeth. And I don't even want to go into that detail because I, apparently there's like different versions of his daughter that he made out there at different life stages. And Gregory's a robot. I don't know if he's a crying child. Um, as, William succeeded in bringing his kids back to life. And I don't know. I'm still a little confused after watching all of those videos. It's very interesting because um, we have these new characters that are helping William to be resurrected and regain life. But it's not really William Afton. It's his consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> and so the creation of the Pizzaplex and Security Breach it is built over Afton's gravesite. And so at this point, I'm thinking, okay, I'm starting to understand how it all came to be. How Afton created the animatronics, the sequence of events that led up to the most recent games. But then I was wrong because I quickly realized, oh, I'm, I'm now confused again. Because with Security Breach and the new VR game, now there's the integration of AI. Now we have new characters, Sun and Moon, Eclipse, um, the Mimic that for some fucking reason was created and I guess was utilized by Henry at the very beginning of animatronic creation, but was stolen by William, just like Baby was stolen by William. Don't even get me started. So now we have all these things <laughs> that really just confuse me. But... That is the basics, I think, of Matt's timeline. Okay? How'd I do? Hope I did okay. Now let's jump into um, it, John from FNAF's theories. Because I wanted to bring up him and ID's uh, fantasy theories because they really made Matt think a little differently Matt's very analytical. He wants to create a very structured timeline that has a lot of evidence from the games and books to support it. But in my opinion, John is a little more um, creative, I want to say. He's very focused in on like his theories. And he stretches a little bit with the evidence. And... Although Matt has some critiques about the theories, John makes a lot of good points in his videos and is able to view the games and books just in like a, a little different way that I think is needed when trying to come up with 
a FNAF timeline. So now John at the FNAF channel, his theories were very interesting because I think it was him who brought up the fact that, well, not the fact, he theorized, it's all just a theory, that uh, the FNAF AR game was William's remnant collection farm. It was his way to collect remnant in order to continue experimenting, doing his shit. Um, But what really caught my attention with FNAF is that John speculated Um, So that was very impressive. And I love that Matt reacted to a lot of John's theories with him. And John was able to support his theories or like tried to just discuss the theories with Matt. And Matt had a lot of pushback to challenge John. Um, But I think that was awesome. And I loved John's theories. Now let's talk about ID's fantasy theories. Now what was really cool in her theories is that she brought up something that John nor Matt talked about in their theories, which was the poster room. I mean, they did talk about it, but not to this extent in that it could have two occupants, which is crazy. And for those of you who want to learn more about her theory, go watch her video. I'm not going to summarize it too much. But that was really awesome to hear because it wasn't an angle that the other theorists had thought of. And it even caught Matt's attention. And he watched her theory videos and had just similar to John's some critiques. It was really fun to watch the progression of Matt's understanding of the FNAF floor with these two different angles of theorizing from John and Idy's fantasy. And now to the current theories, the help wanted two theories. And for those of you who are like, but Serena, you missed a lot of details in these videos. Did you actually watch the videos? Yes, I did. I know I missed a lot of very specific details, but there were a lot of videos. I know that the mediocre melodies were Henry's first creation. They were the first. I know that Eclipse probably was one of the first animatronics. I know that there's a lot of sister location details I skipped over. I know. Cassie's father and his role in the newer games. That was so interesting to hear because there are a lot of connections that he made that make sense. Like during the scene of the bite of 83 with the older brother who lured his brother, the crying child, into the mouth of Freddy, there is a kid next to the older brother that has a mask on. And his theory that Cassie's dad worked in the new pizza, pizzeria, pizza plex, whatever, and is like connected in some way to the newer games is crazy. Like that was wild. He really called it. Um, But that's, that's all I'm going to say because it was just a lot. Are we talking about Afton? 
Michael Afton? Un Afton? Could be either either of them, honestly. But this candy cadet, he is who we see in the back left corner in Help Wanted 2. Let me tell you, they couldn't have released a more perfect game at a more perfect time. Yeah, it'll probably answer a lot of the questions that need some answers. Um, I have played Help Wanted 2. I'm currently playing Help Wanted 2, currently collecting some of the secret, those like voodoo doll things. And I still have, I think, two to collect, maybe. I don't know. I haven't finished the game. So this might have some spoilers, but I'm fine with it. Um, I know currently that I know that in the game you it seems like you are at the Pete's Fazbear's. I don't know where we are, actually. Um, it might be obvious to you, but even with this whole marathon I've been on, I don't know where we are. I can only guess that we're in the like we're we're in <laughs> in one of them and one of them is connected to all of them you know like they're all built mostly on top of each other or within the same vicinity and it seems like to me there's a huge ass stage in help wanted too so it's likely it is the FNAF 6 the simulator one, which was the building of the security breach mall, right? But very quickly, one question starts to rear its ugly head. Who are we? Who are we playing as? Throughout the various mini missions that we're presented with, one line that we hear repeated over and over again is, what makes you so special? We might be Cassie then. I might be jumping to conclusions here, but... We might be Cassie because uh, the mimic who lured us into the mall, um, like they want us to be able to escape. Like they need Cassie to be able to escape into the real world. And so... Cassie is needed. She's wanted. And so maybe they're asking, like, why you? Why are you so special? Why do they want you? And then maybe that connects with, um, that connects with Cassie's dad, who Matt theorized, too. I, I'm still freaking skeptical about this, but Cassie's dad was in connection to the Apton family in the bite of 83 when the crying child died. So he was that like, uh, he had the Bonnie mask on. We know that we're a Faz technician. Midway through the game, oh, you shit. unlock a Faz wrench that allows you to act. Damn it. I spoke too soon. So we're clocking out, meaning that we are working there. We are clocking out. To reach up and remove the AR mask that's been stuck to your face since you first booted up the game. Suddenly, you see that this entire time you've been inside of a derelict pizzeria, worn down, decayed. And this isn't just any ruined pizzeria, it's the FNAF 6 location. Compl hey! Yo! Oh my god, Serena. So proud. So proud. Oh my God. It feels just so good to finally grasp what the fuck is happening. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Complete with a recharge station and a Freddy Spaghetti hole front and center. In Ruin, Helpy tells us that these AR masks were worn to help technicians navigate through the destroyed pizza plex. Now, when I first saw that in the game, I was convinced that it was a trick just to get us to wear the mask and teach us the mechanics of this new game. But mm. here we are in Help Wanted 2 in a destroyed pizza plex wearing a Vanny mask. And right there on the wall is a poster telling staff members to make sure they remove the mask at the end of the day. It proves that what Helpy was saying, at least in this moment, wasn't a trick. 
The mask is in fact a real tool that's used by Fazbear technicians. Crap lost his hold over Vanessa. He needed himself a new helper, so he lured us in, last human employee remaining, and got us to put the pieces back together to reawaken him. The cycle once again repeats. This is then what results- Is Matt saying Cassie's dad is Mattbot? He stuffed him into Mattbot here. For what? a while, there's been a lot of confusion. Wait, but... Now I want to know where, like, the dad... Was he just working and just never came home? Because he got stuck? about the true nature of glitch trap is it a virus is it afton in the mimic ai was bird yeah. trap the mimic what it's the largely been it? left unclear but now i actually think this ending is trying to give us an answer in the books they make it explicitly clear that there are at least two mimics threatening the pizza plex first there's a physical mimic that's buried down in the basement that physically yeah. walks around and is able to kill people then there's the second version a more general ai program that's eventually able to get installed to run the entirety of the pizza plex and is able to control and corrupt all the animatronics that work there Oh my god, Acton went ham with the AIs, huh? So we have an older model that's down in the basement, wants to get out, wants to kill things. Simple. Second version is the brains of the operation and is mimicking Afton? Because that is what is corrupting all the other animatronics. It just got so complicated. Afton's data specifically. It's the one that embodies itself as Glitztrap, okay. and it's also the one that speaks to us in the form of Helpy. And we know this to be true because of what we see throughout Help Wanted 2. In this you know, how creepy. To be Afton, but coming across as healthy, the nice guy. Unlock a glitched coin that allows you to play the fourth and final version of Princess Quest's arcade cabinet. At first, it plays just like your normal Princess Quest minigame. You swing your sword, you kill the glitchy bunnies, you collect the keys. Simple. At least until it's not. You open a door and you suddenly find yourself standing next to someone playing an arcade cabinet. Next thing you know, the princess is standing there in the room with you. <laughs> are you kidding me? Oh, this is nuts. The real world oh, and the digital world are leaking into each other. Reach into the screen, grab your sword and suddenly you are the princess. Who's the princess now? Glowing sword in hand, we fight our way through the glitching bunnies until we meet the old Red King. We give him our Vanny mask, and in return, he gives- I'm kind of sad I watched this video because I want to play that. <laughs> the, the cool ending details have been unveiled. It was us, the glitch trap plushie from Help Wanted 1. And this is where things go really off the rails. Out of nowhere, the sister location elevator appears. Hop in, and suddenly it takes us inside of a giant claw machine with a giant vanny staring in at us. We offer up the glitch trap plushie, revealing the true glitch trap. She crushes him and then fades into darkness. Doing so unlocks a trophy named Consequences. The description reads, System threats found, repair complete. And you see, this is what I meant about endings and beginnings. This to me feels like a very specific end, the end of Vanessa's story, and with it, the end of this current era of FNAF, from Help Wanted 1 to Help Wanted 2. Let's call it the Vanessa arc. She's no longer a part of this story. Her battle's over. We saved her completely. But in closing out her story, the cycle also repeats. Yet again, we have ourselves an innocent girl, this time named Cassie, being lured in by a seemingly friendly voice, Gregory. Mm. But in reality, it's all a trap. Thanks to that occipital implant, she now has Helpy as a part of her mind, just like Vanessa did with oh Glitch. Gosh, and now doomed. she's wearing the mask more and more frequently again like Vanny. So Help Wanted 2 is all about saving Vanessa and ridding her of the threat of Glitch Trap. Wow, so, so is she just not a part of the NAF anymore? Like that seems weird. Is she going to help in some way? She's been such an important character for a while now.
damn, she's even in the movie. So, yeah, that'll be interesting. All right. That's it. That's the wrap up for the FNAF Marathon. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.